Um, technology. All right. All right, let's get it on. Um, so anyway, uh, so that's kind of the basic, the essential questions about ethics. That's kind of um, what was just this basically is getting to. Um, you know, necessary and sufficient conditions. That's kind of what we're just talking about. Um, you know, if uh, necessary and sufficient is an interesting kind of term. Um, we always use the example of an omelet. It's a French idea. This, this idea of necessity comes from French philosophy. What is necessary to make an omelet? Eggs. And what, and what about those eggs in particular? Does just having eggs make an omelet? Well, it can. How? Does, if I just sit eggs here, will it become an omelet? Well, I mean, you have to cook it, I suppose. Well, there's a lot of things going on there, well, I suppose, right? <laughs> That's the whole point. <laughs> eggs are necessary, but are they sufficient? No. And this is that kind of sense. You got to, right? This necessary and sufficient is an interesting kind of claim. Simply having eggs is not an omelet mate, right? Um, simply having morals is not an ethic mate. It's the same kind of thing. Clearly, it's necessary to have a moral position, but having a moral position is not sufficient for an ethics. That's kind of what we're talking about, all right? And that's what they're talking about here. Um, any general questions on this short little piece? Good, then I'm going to ignore it. Um, you guys can go back and look at that. Uh, the next was just kind of the sense of what is a moral issue. Um, same kind of thing. I'll just kind of real quick stress this. Um, you know, morals, in, in the very real sense, are the views you hold, the beliefs you hold, that dictate your ethics. Make sense? Can you have an ethics without morality? That's an interesting philosophical question. All right, what would it mean to have an ethics without a moral position behind it? Um, I think we're going to end up there, actually, in the end of this class. It's got a sense that we agree that we need ethics, but we're really unclear about the morals. That's where we're going to kind of end up, right? And because morals are absolute, that's kind of that sense, right? Morals don't seem to have much fluidity. If you believe that murder is wrong, then it's hard to find an exception. Does that make sense? If you believe that four people living is more important than one, then killing one becomes easy. I mean, this is where things get kind of weird, right? Those videos that I don't make, those are to give you another voice. I guess I should explain this. Um, those videos are to give you another voice. Not everybody agrees on these things. I'm not saying that, right? Okay, I'm sorry, read that again. It says, um, it was under the moral issues are those actions which have the potential to harm or harm others or ourselves. And it said unintentional actions are also still moral issues, only it's dependent on a consistent theory of human action. Hmm. That was like the, the, like the drug user one. Like, that was the example for that one? Yeah, I mean, you can, they, a lot of people like to do that. They like to say, you know, like a drug abuser unintentionally harms their family, that kind of stuff, blah, blah, blah. But again, and why they're saying you need a consistent view of human nature, because that's what they're saying is, to make that claim, then we have to really have a sweeping view that human nature is a certain thing. Does that make sense? That's what they're kind of trying to say there. Um, that's humanism. We're going to read about humanism. I hate humanism <laughs> um, because of that kind of stuff right there. The same kind of sense that there's only one way to be human. And that's what they mean by a consistent view of humanity, right? Can we have a consistent view of humanity? You can count me amongst the ones that goes, mm, I don't know. Uh, my experience with humanity is if there's anything that's inconsistent. So, I don't know. I mean, is there things, the human condition? <coughs> Do we all have to drink water and eat food? Absolutely. Does that lead to some kind of moral dictate? I'm not so sure. So, make sense? Does that help a little bit? Does that help? And we'll kind of be doing that whole, all semester. So we'll be addressing those issues the entire semester. Um, any other questions about the general moral ethics kind of thing? All right, let's dive into the creeds. This week we're kind of doing Plato and Socrates. Um, just a little bit, you know, this little piece, the Socratic paradox. Um, this is just kind of an explanation of Plato was, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, it kind of talks about the ring of Gyges and some stuff like that. But the interesting reading is the Republic. All right, this is Plato. So this is actually Plato. Um, we're reading about the cave analogy. It comes out of this text here. Plato's Republic. Um, this is by far the best translation of Plato's Republic, too, right here. Uh, the Alan Bloom translation. Um, there's a lot of bad translations out there when it comes to the Greeks. <laughs> a lot. Um, you know, I, I can show you how dense this stuff is. Right? This is when you read something for a long time, this is what happens. You read it multiple times, right? it just gets more and more. There's a lot going on here, is all I'm trying to say. Um, 
give you some background in Greece. So here we go. Now we're getting, we're getting real for the first time. Kind of. um, so, so here we go. This is kind of the beginning of Western morals, if you will. The argument starts with the pre-Socratics, right? And the pre-Socratics want to know one thing. What is phusis? Phusis. What an interesting term. Um, this gets translated by the Romans as natura. You start to see the movement, right? Nature. Um, prior to Socrates, everybody in the ancient world knew everything they knew about reality through Homer. Who was Homer? You know, he wrote the Iliad, the Odyssey, all right, you've seen pictures. Um, basically, every, the Greek ethos, this is the term we use, the Greek ethos came through Homer. And by ethos, we really just mean ethics, in a sense, the way to live, the right and wrong way to live, right? So in, in Odysseus, we see what it means to be brave, what it means to be, you know, strong, what it means to put the state above your individual desires, right? all this kind of stuff. And the idea is, is that Homer told you everything you need to know about right and wrong. And for the most part, the Greeks just accepted that, right? Kind of blindly accepted it. And the first philosophers aren't interested in the ethos. The first philosophers want to know what phusis is. What, what's, what's phusis made out of? You know, everything is water, everything is fire. <coughs> Everything is ether. These are the kind of these arguments they make. Everything is atoms. So the atomists argue everything was atoms. So this question of what is phusis, what is nature, this was the first philosophical question. And Socrates changes all that. Now, two things. One, all we know about Socrates is he's dead because he wrote nothing down, right? So all we know about Socrates is what Plato tells us about Socrates. There are a couple of references to Socrates and a couple of other uh, authors, Exonim and a couple others. And we get this kind of weird view of Socrates as this, he's called the midwife, the gadfly, the torpedo fish. If a midwife helps you give birth, what does Socrates help you do? Is he helping you come up with your own efforts? Yeah, right? He's helping you give birth to what you already have in you. That's the idea. So the Greeks believe, this is a very important point, the Greeks believed when it came to this kind of sense of ethos, it was already in you. You already knew what right and wrong was inside of you. It's just you'd forgotten. And now, I'm not going to dwell on this too long. You know, the Greeks had a very complex sense of, uh, of the soul, um, which, by the way, if you want to know what the translation of soul is, or it comes from, it comes from this term called suke. Suke is a soul. So they had a very interesting view of the soul. And it's basically what's called transmigration. What does that mean, transmigration? Anybody know? Moving from one place to another. Yeah, that's kind of what the soul does, right? So the soul moves from place to place. I mean, that really is kind of the sense what it means. Um, you know, I'm not, again, I'm not going to dwell on it. Plato's Republic, the end of it has this big myth of Ur. And the myth of Ur is a story about the soul. You die, and you go up to this place, and this big mouth determines whether you've been good or bad. It's really kind of crazy stuff. But then ultimately, it's all said and done. You choose another life here on Earth. And to learn how the soul lived here will determine what soul it picks the next life, and blah, 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 blah. Um, but the idea was the soul kept coming back. So that's why Socrates is a midwife, because again, the argument is you already have in you that sense of right and wrong. It just needs to be brought, it's been lost. Because the idea is when the soul comes back to earth, it has to, it has to cross the, the river Lethe. And the river Lethe is the river of forgetting. So the idea is you have to drink from the river of the Lethe before they're allowed back. So you forget everything about your past life. That's the idea. Right? You can start to see how this is, kind of plays out, right? Um, so Socrates is famous for saying, Phusis taught me nothing about being human, which is anthropos, by the way. Don't worry too much about these Greek terms. I just give them to you for, you know, a heck of it. <laughs> um, so anthropos means the human. Um, Socrates said, Phusis will not teach me, but he, Socrates is famous, well, Plato is famous for saying Socrates, says, I spent my youth in Phusis. So he spent his youth following the original philosophers, trying to understand what Phusis was. But then he realized what he wanted to know wasn't what made up phusis, he wanted to know what it meant to be a good human. And that's what's not going on in this original question, because we already had that. We already knew what it meant to be a good person, right? Homer already told us that. Socrates is the first one to go, how do you know Homer's not drunk? Homer could have been batshit crazy. How do you know? Um, how do we know that what he said is right? And this is this kind of new move that 
cuts off this argument and pushes it into an argument of the poles. So, so with Socrates, with, with Plato, the argument moves from what is thusis to really, let's just go ahead and say it, what is justice? This is where the argument starts to move, right? And we start to see real quick that what's happening is ethics, this sense of the anthropos, which gets linked to the ethos, <coughs> is really directly linked to justice, which you can't get outside the polis. So as we're going to see, many philosophers are going to say there's no, there's no justice in thusis. There's no justice in nature. Do you guys agree with that? There's no justice in nature? Yes. Yeah, why? Because isn't it just something that we made up? Say that again? Is it just something that we made up? We made, we, we up. made up and then we mentioned believe in it? Well, that's an interesting claim. So is all ethics just an opinion? Right? We're, that might be where we end up, right? That's people have their own morality. What's that? That's people have their own morals. Well, this is, this is kind of the billion dollar question, right? This yeah. is really what Plato wants to know. <clears throat> is this all just opinion? Or is there something that transcends opinion, which this is the kind of battle that's going on. Did I say anything? Okay. Um, so, let me erase this and show you how it kind of plays out. So what Plato says, <coughs> Plato goes, okay. So this whole argument's coming up. I mean, if we, if we believe so if we believe the existence of Socrates, I think there's a subtle argument out there that says we shouldn't, but I don't want to get into that. Um, this kind of argument's going on for about 100 years. There's kind of this pushing, there's this kind of going back and forth. And with Socrates, you kind of finally get this, this point that that this argument we've been having has shifted. And it's shifted from kind of right and wrong to what Plato wants to say is, what is the good? And this is, this is the beginning of Western philosophy as we know it. Right? Plato's little move where he says, all right, everybody just slow down. What do you mean when you say something is good? And this is this kind of how this game breaks. Now what Plato does is fascinating. He says, look, and this is the beginning of the, this is, I can't stress enough, this is the beginning of this, this separation we're going to be watching for the entire semester. He says, is the good a matter of episteme, or is it a matter of doxa? This is a juxtaposition between these two terms. Um, let me give you this one. Doxa, because this would be the hardest one to guess. Doxa basically means belief. It's opinion, um, is belief and opinion different? Is there a difference? I mean, this is a subtle. I'm not asking this question because I have the right answer. I think this is an interesting question. All right, this is another thing. I think there's a lot of back and forth on this. And I'm going to leave one out. There's another one here. What's the other one that relates to these two? You want to guess? This will come back up later. Faith. All right, this one will show back up. The Greeks don't have a real robust sense of faith, which is kind of interesting if you start to think about it. Um, this evolves out of this, if you will. And we'll see, is faith and belief the same thing? I'm not going to dwell too much. We're going to come back to this when we get to the existentialist. But I'll, I'll give you a little hint. What Kierkegaard is going to say is, it's not this that makes us human. It's this that makes us human. But we'll get there. Um, there's something weird about faith. I'll, so belief, there's between belief and faith, clearly, is, so I might believe that the sun goes around the earth. Does it make sense? I might believe that. And I have a lot of reasons to believe that, right? Why do I have a lot of reasons to believe that? Because you see it every day. Because <laughs> I see the thing go over the sky, right? I mean, so you think about it, observation, this is, this is again the intro class more than this class, but you know, observation is a bad thing. It's a, it, observation is not what it seems like, right? Just because the sun looks like it's, right, the sun's not doing nothing. But. So I can believe that, but then that belief can change, right? Because something can change that belief. Can faith change? Well, that's what kind of this, we'll see. There's this kind of strain. And this becomes a real issue. But for right now, we'll leave it out because it's not really in play here in the beginning. Um, so now what do you think epistemic is? If it's the opposite, yeah. It's like knowledge or fact. Yeah, right, exactly. I mean, so yeah, and what Socrates are, what Plato wants to know is, look, is the good something I can know? In which case, there is a right and wrong. I hope you see that, right? If I can know the good, <coughs> then I can know what is right or wrong. Make sense? If the good is always already an opinion, 
then there really is no such thing as right and wrong. At least not beyond, and this is the kind of the binder, the, the human. Right? And so the question kind of becomes, you know, what is the human relationship to the good? And this is what, this is where the beginning of philosophy, I can't stress enough, this is the beginning of Western philosophy as we know it, is this, you know, what's going on here? So no, this is kind of the beginning of this movement is, you know, if I can know the good, then right and wrong transcends the human. Does it make sense? Can you see what he's doing here? So, in relationship to this question, Plato does this. He says, look, it seems as though we have a, a problem. <laughs> um, let me get rid of this. We'll keep the good, because it's always about the good. All right? He has this famous thing called the divided line. And uh, this is what the cave's going to become. So in, this, in the Republic, just going to give you a quick background, in the Republic, uh, they're trying to, what's going on is the tyrants have been overthrown, the Republic has been put into place, the tyrants used to run Athens. The tyrants are kind of pissed. They think that they've been boon swoggled, that justice is what the strong say it is, and now the weak are in control, and that's bad for us, because they know the good, <coughs> if you will, right? And the Republic starts with this kind of sense of, we demand you tell us what justice is. Which right there is an interesting thing, right? I demand you tell us what justice is. And Homer had already told us what justice was, right? And that's what the tyrants used. The tyrants ruled Athens according to Homer, right? He, they've been overthrown. The, the Republic has overthrown the tyrants. And now the tyrants are pissed. And they want a definition of justice that ultimately supports their view. Does that make sense? What Phil's kind of trying to do is he says, everybody wants that. Everybody wants justice to support their view. If it turns out justice, if the good is just a doxa, and you can, um, and what Plato's doing here is he's trying to say, let's go ahead and assume that we can know the good, right? So this is kind of this assumption Plato makes. And he says, you know, it's interesting, we start out, everybody starts out seeing shadows. And by shadows, he means just that, right? Reflections of something else. So we start out as kids, as children, if you will, seeing shadows. And then we realize those shadows are produced by images, objects, if you will. The term object doesn't exist in Greek, so that's why it's kind of a strange, but the best way to kind of you guys understand what's going on here is that you see a shadow of a tree, kind of, so it's not really the tree, it's kind of a shadowy tree, and you realize that that's really the result of a tree, right? So you realize there's a tree, but simply realizing that doesn't equate to knowing it's a tree. That makes sense, right? So then this kind of dotted line is when you start to move into the realm of knowledge. So this is the realm of doxa. Everything's an opinion here, right? Um, your opinion of the shadow is your opinion of the shadow, because the shadow doesn't have a, a stand of its own. The object appears to stand on its own, but then we realize it's, and again, the term object doesn't exist, it's just an image. So this question is, what is it an object of? What is it an image of? And that's the realm of knowledge, the realm of knowing. So now I know that the tree is a conifer. See where he's kind of going with this? There's you know, a conifer here, we've got some decisions, you know, we've got different types of trees, right? So I can know these things. But knowledge is still not understanding. Right? And the ultimate is the sense of understanding the good. And so it's a hierarchy. Right? And this is what's going on here. It's a movement. And clearly, this is the realm of philosophy, right? the realm of understanding. Um, at least this is what this claim that Plato's making. So he says, look, if the shadows are the result of the good, then it's a trickle-down kind of good. Down here you're getting, let's say, 2% of the good. I'm playing fast and loose this is not play. this is just me trying to explain it, right? Here we jump up maybe to 10% of the good. But we're still, as long as you're in doxa, you're not in the good. I hope that's very clear. As you start to turn, and the reason this is a dotted line and not a solid line, because there's a sense in which these are very different places. This is kind of more of a bleeding. There's a bleeding between the images and the knowledge of them. And it's not a solid, that's why it's not a solid line. It's kind of a, it's hard to tell when we're in the realm of images or in the realm of knowledge. That's why there's this kind of bleeding. But there's a sense in which this is the realm of knowing up here. Um, and these are the, 
it, you know, if I want to kind of get use a different term, this is the realm of intelligence. All right, so opinion versus intelligence. And you start to see the structure that we really still hold to this day, right, if you think about it. Um, one of the ways we can look at this is to play this game. What game is this? In terms of this, what do those represent? Thank you. All right? You start to see, I mean, does that help kind of explain kind of what's going on here? You start to see what's going on. You really can't separate the question of the good from justice for the Greeks. And in large part, that's because of the polis, all right? There's a sense in which the Greeks kind of blindly assume that it's better to be civilized than a barbarian. Because keep in mind, there's lots of people in the world, right? The Greeks are just one of many. You've got the Persians, right? You've got the Babylonians still. You've got the Hebrews, um, the Egyptians. You know, the list goes on and on. Um, you also had kind of the northern roaming tribes, right? So places like Germany now, those kind of places. Um, they were kind of considered barbarians because they didn't have cities, right? So the American Indians, when they find the Indians, we just, we just went ahead and did the same thing to them. <clears throat> this assumption about justice and the good, I think we need to take serious, especially in ethics, because, you know, there's a way in which it just seems blindly assumed. It's not clear that it is good, but it's clear that we're in the habit of thinking that it's good. And that's, that's an interesting place to be, right? Um, so anyway, so, so back to kind of the sense of, you know, what Plato's doing here. And I thought today, the best thing we kind of try to show what I hear Plato saying, not in terms of, you know, like I said, a prescriptive ethic, but really kind of a look. If we want to say that X is good, then this is what's going to have to, this is what's going to have to exist to hold that if that makes sense, right? Like this is the logical necessity, if you will. So, again, you know, I'll point out that basically the Greeks get all their ethos, it all comes from Homer, right? And Homer's story is about what it means to be just and what it means to be brave and all these kind of things. And nobody really challenges that until, like I said, Socrates, and we told that kind of story. And then Socrates, and this is kind of the debate that goes on in Plato's Stallers, is what's Plato doing with Socrates. But the story he tells is pretty clear. Um, Socrates gets convicted of corrupting the youth and introducing new gods to the state. Those are the two things he got corrupted of. Um, like I said, on Wednesday, he could have probably gotten away if he had just, you know, went shucks, I'm sorry. But of course, he said, you guys are all morons. And well, we learned really quickly what happens when you call people stupid. Anyway, uh, Socrates drinks the hemlock. He dies. Anyway, you can read it. He, taught, he describes the death. How his feet start to go numb and stuff like this and blah, blah, blah. And then right, the very last word Socrates says is, oh, by the way, make sure you sacrifice a rooster to the gods just in case I'm wrong. Because he's, he's disobeying. He's gone against the rules of the state, right? And the rules of the state, which of course included Homer, is that certain things have to be done, right? When, when before you die, you sacrifice a cock to the gods because blah, blah, blah. blah. All, these, all these stories, right, about what you're supposed to do. And then Plato has Socrates right before he dies, right before he dies, go, oh yeah, by the way, just, yeah, go ahead and go ahead. And, you can go ahead and sacrifice that, just, just in case, right? Better safe than sorry. So does he like doubt himself now? What's that? Does he doubt himself too? Well, there's just kind of, what's Plato doing there, right? I mean, what's, why does Plato have Socrates make that his last word? I mean, of all the things he could have said, right? Why that? Is, is that a shout out to Plato just kind of saying, you never really know. When push comes to shove, you're never going to know. So, you know, pray to all the gods, right? And be, you know, follow all the religions because you just don't know, right? So, so back to this kind of sense where Plato's going to try to deal with this problem. So, like I said, um, where's, there it is. You know, Plato splits us. He's the first one to do it. This knowledge versus belief claim, right? And, I mean, you can see that's, and I'll say it one more time, if it wasn't for that magic from Egypt, quote unquote, it would be easier to say it's all just opinion, it's all just made up, and then blah, screw it, go fast, right there, you know. So. Um, then he goes, oh, by the way, this seems to work whether you're Egyptian, Greek, Chinese, them, you know, even the barbarians have to follow it. Why? 
What makes that? What's, what's going on? This is clearly is not a belief. We tend to like, we tend to be comfortable in belief, right? It's, it's, it's more comforting to know. It's very uncomfortable to not know. Um, in fact, that's why philosophy by its nature should make you uncomfortable. If it's not making you uncomfortable, you're not paying attention, right? It should make you uncomfortable. Because what it's doing is exposing how much we go through life believing stuff that's really just a belief.